Good afternoon, everyone. Can you all hear us? Excellent. Okay, today's session is, uh, this afternoon's session is about funding and partnerships. And uh, as it says in the uh, scripts in front of you, the idea for us is to talk, I think initially possibly about markets mature versus uh, some of the emerging markets. But we're going to go a little bit further, a little bit broader than that today. We have a really wonderful, unique group of panelists here today um, that are going to give you different perspectives on a lot of the issues we've already talked about through the earlier sessions. Um, to begin with, we have a person who will be representing federations. We have one that will be looking at from a host city's point of view. We have the sponsor represented out here. What does a sponsor look for in the commercialization and the funding of these events? Uh, we're going to look outside of sport and sponsorship as well and look at uh, science and other type of events that we can do that have similar but very different commercial models. Um, what I'm going to do, just to lay the ground rules up front here, um, we're going to involve you guys as well, so if you have questions, you can start thinking of them now. Um, I'm not going to do, introduce everyone at once. I'm going to introduce each individual panel member one at a time, let them have a couple of minutes to chat to you, ask a question or two, and once we get through that, it's ideally going to be a very interactive session between the group. I'm just here to help them talk about all the different angles of uh, the various elements of the same equation, which is sport, sponsorship, and the funding therein. Um, allow me to go right to it then, because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, let's just see if technology will keep me going here. And the first person who's going to speak is uh, Lou, Lou Cher. Um, Lou's Chief Revenue Officer of U.S. Tennis in his role, he's responsible for corporate partnerships, sales, business development, basically all the money, bringing in all the revenues to the game. Um, and that includes USTA itself, the US Open, of course, one of the four majors, the Emirates Airline US Open series, which uh, we'll discuss a little later as well. Um, in addition, uh, Lou oversees partnerships, marketing, licensing, hospitality, the whole works. So uh, the funding of tennis is obviously his baby. Um, prior to that, Lou also worked at Madison Square Gardens. Correct. Uh, also in New York, where he served as senior VP marketing partnerships for MSG Sports and Entertainment. And uh, Lou will also be able to bring to us outside of sport the whole idea of music. I believe you did probably the biggest sponsorship of its time in terms of naming rights. So we can, we can yeah. go into the world outside of sport, particularly with things like Expo being hosted here as well. Um, I'm going to hand over to Lou now. Amongst others, he will give us the ideas, the background, the understanding from a sporting federation's point of view. Lou, over David, to you. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, thank you for, uh, for having us uh, back again this year. We're thrilled to, uh, to be here and participate in this, uh, in this conference. I noticed that you, uh, you didn't divulge that the panel here was uh, primarily Canadian. Uh, I'm not... I'm not sure why. I don't know who's left in Canada now that you're all here, but... Uh, yeah. uh, you can see that there's actually, and, and I'll let you figure it out afterwards, but there's three panel members here, all from Canada and all from Toronto. None of us live here. But oh, there's more. There's what? more. None, None of, of us them live, live in Canada. And, and we're wondering where the mayor is, if, if, he, if he's going to send right. in some questions. No, no yeah, mayor. So, so t apparently Toronto's new marketing slogan, a great place to be from. Yes. Uh, so, again, thank you for the introduction. Uh, just for a brief moment to, to give you an overview on, on the USTA and what we do, we are the national governing body for the sport of tennis in the United States, and as such, our mission is to grow participation. Uh, and as we say, to grow participation and ensure that tennis looks like America from uh, an ethnic uh, diversity standpoint. Uh, we do so not because we're invested in the sale of rackets or courts or balls or tennis apparel, things like that. We do it out of a belief that, that tennis, along with other sports, certainly, um, can enhance the quality of people's lives and, and participating in sports, being healthy and active. And tennis is one of the um, most successful dual gender sports on a global basis and, and as one of the few sports that can be enjoyed from birth or, or early uh, all the way through later stages of your life is sort of uniquely positioned uh, to support a healthy, active lifestyle. The U.S. Open is, is really the crown jewel from a commercial standpoint uh, within the USTA portfolio. Uh, it is the economic engine that supports all of the work we do in the community. We're a nonprofit organization. The U.S. Open will generate close to $300 million U.S. 
uh, per year. The proceeds off of that event are all reinvested back into the growth of the game, facilitating and growing uh, participation. Um, given the, the topic um, that we were, we were asked to speak to today, which is, which is largely around sponsorship, uh, to some extent in emerging markets, also mature markets. I, I, if I could take a second, I know you're going to ask us a lot of very sophisticated questions, but if I could maybe take a, a risk on, on stating the obvious, uh, one of the, the key pieces in, in sponsorship with any sports property that's often overlooked is the actual sales organization and sales structure itself. Too many events will identify an event director, tournament director, someone to run the event, um, and also task that individual with the sale of sponsorship as one of five or six or seven hats that they may wear. Um, the events that are successful have a, a dedicated sales resource, invest in resources necessary to go solicit opportunities, whether it be agencies or dedicated staff, to service partners, to identify partners, to develop sponsorship platforms for partners. You can't do it any other way. And, and asking someone to, to uh, worry about the event, logistics and operation, and also at the same time go out and sell and, and service partners, it's impossible. You're, you're too focused on making sure the event happens. Uh, and, and you lose sight of the fact that sponsorship is the economic lifeblood for, for many events, and, and your largest priority gets relegated to someone's second and third or fourth sort of priority. So um, we'll talk about many other things, but, but I would not lose sight of the fact, and we can talk about how to pick agencies and things like that, don't lose sight of the fact that you need to invest in resources to go sell and generate that revenue. Yeah, thanks, Lou. I mean, that's a, that's a topic we want to explore with all the different role players here today is, we can have events and we can have cities that pay for events, but are they the same without the sponsor's input? And what are the commercial models and they allow activation and do they get bums in the seats as we, we like to talk about it? Uh, Lou, just a quick question on you. You touched on participation, which we we'll sure. probably won't come back to later, but you know, according to the stats, I have US Tennis is the largest organization, tennis organization yeah. in the world. 17 geographical sections, more than 700,000 individual members. 30 million players, 700,000 dues-paying USTA members, correct. And, and 7,000 organizational dues-paying members. Yes. Okay. And obviously, on the one side, you're talking about healthy nation participation, growing the game. On the other side, there's got to be an expectation, being America, being the biggest, to be the best. And how important is having a number one men's tennis player, how important is it to win or have we just adopted the Roger Federer as it's our home and it doesn't matter because the US Open will sell out as long as we bring the top players? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. So I think the belief in the US for many, many years was you couldn't be successful unless you, unless you had a transcendent American personality of Tiger Woods um, to, to, drive the, to drive the sport. Um, what we've seen, the past 10 years have been our most successful years ever, uh, and we've done that in the absence of, a, of an American male driving, and certainly Serena Williams on the, on the women's side fills that bill in every way, shape, or form. Um, but we haven't, we haven't had that American figure uh, in play over the past 10 years or so, and our business has grown and participation has grown. So I don't know that that's the case. Tennis, as an international sport, I think has appeal, and the personalities in the sport are very much um, international iconic figures. Um, you could argue that, that the four top players, certainly the three top players on the men's side today, Federer, Nadal, Djokovic, um, are all historic players, uh, best of all time candidates that are battling each other on a weekly or, so or monthly basis. And so you, you, you've got that interest. Um, having said that, I think to the domestic audience in the U.S., from a television standpoint, if we had a high profile American, we would certainly benefit on that aspect, but you know, we, we sell every ticket to uh, every session of the U.S. Open. We've, we've had incredible uh, increases in both our domestic and our international broadcast rights, so that piece hasn't been there. As an organization, while player development, elite player development is part of our mission and our mandate, and we've invested heavily in developing the next generation of hopeful American champions, that's just one aspect of what we do. Our, our primary focus is participation broad based, and whether that's six-year-old, 60-year-old, 70-year-old, uh, that is our focus, getting more people to play. We know that the more kids that play, the broader the pipeline, the more likely we'll find talented athletes who will develop, but that's not the purpose of it. The, the, that's a byproduct of participation. Correct. Look, I, I look at the same thing in a market like South Africa, mm -hmm. where it's a very immature tennis market. We haven't had any 
for some time great sure. players. We've got sure. one or two coming through the cracks. But to the, the, the population as a whole, tennis, uh, we can't give it away. We, we look for a sponsor like Roger every day. We can't give it away because the, the local tennis, we don't have the big international events, and we're not winning globally. So how do we grow it? How do we find our Venus Williams? That, that, that's an issue going forward. Yeah, please. yeah, Roger, I'm going to introduce you now. So jump in, though. Sorry, yeah, we had talked about this being an informal discussion and trying to have a conversation up here, and that's what I intend to do. But to Lou's point, it's important, the player development element of what Lou just spoke about, but from an international sponsor's perspective, the fact that we're in a golden era of tennis right now and that those four top players are international players, non-Americans, for us was really a driving factor. We knew those four guys were, were going to continue on barring injuries for the next 10 years, yeah. and that was really key for us. And then on the women's side, whether the, the, the Williams sisters were there or not, it was irrelevant what nationality they were. They were just, you know, Vena, uh, Serena's just head and shoulders over everyone else, and that's what the interest is from our perspective. We know internationally we're gaining more people watching tennis because of the Williams sisters or as a rank or some of the ladies, but more importantly, in my opinion, on the male side, these men have been dominating for years and they'll continue to dominate. Oh, so the from, from a sport, us. it's a really interesting case study tennis because it's one of the first that very quickly, if you talk about equal rights or women in sport and the growth of it, are quite phenomenal we're, what you guys have we're, done. We're, we're very proud of the fact that um, We've achieved a level of gender equity that I don't think any other significant or yeah. major, and major sport has. And, and I think a lot of that goes back to the legacy of Billie Jean King. And, and we were offering equal prize money in 1974. Correct. Just uh, Roger jumped in. But for those of you who Sorry. don't know him in the, uh, in the room, Roger Duthie, he's from Emirates Air, obviously. He worked as a sports marketing for 20 years. Just completed your 13th year at Emirates as a head of sponsorship. So if you haven't, if you're from here and you haven't approached him, for no. money. No. <laughs> see Boutros. <laughs> You've done something wrong. You should know him. Um, he, he'll from, tell people to see me. I tell people to see If you're from the rest Boutros. of the world, you're probably still trying to get a hold of him, given some of the sponsorship <laughs> they've been spending on football teams and the like uh, around the world. Uh, Roger's responsible for managing the group's sponsorship portfolio, uh, and uh, obviously uh, all of Emirates' corporate communications as well, I believe. Um, you've been involved in negotiations of many of the key sponsorship deals. U.S. Tennis, so we're going to have a little session here where they'll tell you why uh, the partnership was formed and how the strategic fit came. Uh, Arsenal Football Club, uh, Real Madrid now, Formula One, um, the list goes on and on. And uh, uh, I, I think what's important here is we often talk about how to do successful events and we don't always think about the strategic fit with our partners and how to have yourself associated with the right brands is as much a rub off on them as it is on you as a host city or as an event or whatever the case. So you must pick your partners wisely because it's a reflection on your, uh, your ethos and where you're going and your brand and your image and everything else. Uh, Roger's going to provide, as I said, the sponsor's perspective. So maybe just, you know, take us through sure. and give us an idea of what you look for in a, in a sponsor. I mean, there's a, there's a couple of myths I want to clear up and one we don't sponsor in every single market that we travel to. I mean, people think we're flying to a new destination that immediately, you know, if it's in Europe, we start getting 30 million euro uh, proposals thrown at us every day. And that's not the case. We're very strategic with our, with our partnerships and what we, what we want to partner, we'll par partner with. Uh, sponsorship is a communications tool for us. And it may or may not work in that individual market. It, it's up to the market objectives, what we want to promote in a new destination whether it's product, Dubai, onwards, the various elements from our, from our business that we want to promote. We'll take a step back and say, well, let's look at that market, let it mature a year, and then we'll go in, and if we determine through our internal processes that we have that a partnership, a sponsorship property is the way to go, then we'll start evaluating the right properties, and then we'll work and, and go through our due diligence, and there's a whole process, process involved. But, we don't just go into a new market and say, great, we're going to sponsor something in that market because we're flying there. Very strategic. Um, and what I, what I would advise those of you from you know, emerging markets or, um, who, want, who want to approach us, I would advise know what we're about as a brand, um, do some research on Emirates and what we sponsor and what we don't sponsor. Um, make sure you understand that our, your local event, if it's in an emerging market or a mature market, has to fall in line with our current strategy. Um, some examples of that, and there's no disrespect to those markets, what I'm about to say, but um, you know, we won't sponsor something like elephant polo in Thailand. 
We've been given those proposals. They're great uh, uh, for those particular markets, but they don't fit in with our global strategy, nor does goat racing in Uganda. These are true, actual examples. It has to fit in with our global strategy as well. Now, budgets are being squeezed everywhere. We're in tough economic times, particularly the airlines. Yet Emirates keeps ticking over. It seems to be finding budgets. So there's obviously a recipe that works. What are you doing different that the other airlines maybe aren't catching on to? I'll tell you, our, our president, Mr. Tim Clark, um, probably said it best recently when, when that question was raised. How do, you, how do you keep spending in these tough economical times? How do you keep spending on, on you know, how can you afford to spend? And, and Tim said, how can we afford not to? You know, when, when, the tough, when there's a tough economic uh, recession or going on in, in, in the economy, marketing is, from, from our perspective, the most important thing, and that's what sponsorship is for us. It's a marketing platform. So, yeah, we'll keep driving home the message, and it's a brand-building exercise around the world for us in, in various markets. So it's important for us to keep, to keep investing in sponsorship. Of course, there's a cap, and we're very, as I said, we're very careful. We don't have deep pockets. We're very strategic. But we do budget and plan for these sort of things. Yeah. No, 100%. I mean, uh, if I look at how the Emirates sponsorship has evolved over the last 10 to 15 years, I mean, clearly, I think the, the initial was getting the brand out there. Uh, big properties, the arsenals, obviously, the icing on the cake, the Real Madrids of recent, into markets where you weren't possibly known all that well. Uh, has that changed now, or are you still in that evolving stage? There's other things the involved, but still the basic of it. I mean, one example we discussed earlier is we have no properties in Brazil. But our research has shown that our, you know, our recall is off the charts. Um, and that's because of our EPI, our European football clubs uh, partnerships, our, you know, our shirt sponsorship. So yeah, I think in certain markets, the branding, building the brand is still there. America, for, for an example, our research shows that we're still low in awareness there. Japan, we're still low in awareness. So we're doing some things strategically and through our comms and through our marketing to hopefully um, alleviate those problems, but sponsorship is part of the, the marketing mix that we're using to help alleviate those problems. So the answer is, yeah, we are still building the brand globally. Okay. Fantastic. I think now that you mentioned uh, America, it allows me to open the door to my next speaker, which is uh, Mark Reeves from the NFL. And, you know, given all the football that you're sponsoring, perhaps there's one more gridiron football that we can sponsor in America going forward. Um, I did the introduction here. We've all, we've all seen that now. Uh, Mark joined NFL in 2010 uh, as the league's first ever international commercial director. And if you look at how big a league, and I'll let Mark tell you all about it, but how big the NFL juggernaut, I guess, is in terms of financial and everything else, and, and the job now to take it to the rest of the world where it's never really been marketed until very recently when you took on this job. Uh, Mark oversees marketing, fan development, sponsorship, commercial efforts for the league outside of the United States. So he's the man going into the fire where you come from an environment where everybody knows about you and now I look at this example, if we were in a similar conference in America, the topics would be predominantly around NFL football and various issues relating to it and are you going to London and is there a franchise and things like that where it's an afterthought in other markets in South Africa, it'll be about World Cups and things of that nature. So very different, uh, a very different way of interacting with potential clients and growing the market. Prior to joining NFL, Mark was uh, Vice President of IMG Consulting Division responsible for client management at West Coast Business Development, uh, and that role your oversight and management of sports and entertainment marketing activities for numerous corporate clients. I believe you had a role in tennis as well at some point, so we can, we can bring you in with Lou on debates about tennis. Mark's going to share with us the ideas around a professional sports league perspective. Firstly, maybe a little bit about the NFL, and then we can get into the, the whole task at hand, the opportunities, and the difficulties that come with expansion in new markets. Yeah. Mark. Thank you, and thank you all for uh, having me. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here, and this is my first time in Dubai, so I'm very excited about this. We're a new market for the NFL to explore, clearly. But um, Super Bowl here? Yeah, yes, <laughs> Super Bowl 2050. Um, but what, to give you a little background, I'm not sure how familiar people are with the NFL, but in the U.S., the NFL is, is a juggernaut. It, it truly is far and away the, the most popular sport in America. It's a $10 billion a year business. We have 180 million fans. There's nothing that comes close. And we actually have programming 365 days a year, which is really fascinating because a game itself is three hours. And in that game, there's only 11 minutes of action. And yet that fuels content throughout the entire year. And 
that didn't happen by accident. It, it's been a very strategic plan and, and growth plan, the way we've built our brand, and we're very cognizant of how we control our content, how we distribute our content, and how we've built our brand. And, and I always joke, but to walk into our office, if you took the football paraphernalia off the wall, you'd think you were walking into an investment bank. We hire people from McKinsey and Goldman Sachs, and it's very much data quant oriented of how do we take this small amount of content that we have and spread it throughout A, America, and now further the globe. Um, and to that end, we also protect our brand like all great brands do. So a brand like Emirates, we, we take a very similar approach to what the NFL is about. We distill down to our, our brand values, our brand essence, and not only do we make sure that anytime we talk about the NFL, we're using those kinds of terms, but we also bring our partners in. We have 30 different league partners, and with them, we sit down and talk about our brand essence, which is effectively meaningful, unifying, and intense, and talk about where that fits with our partners so that when we're out there communicating, or when they're out there communicating about their partnership, we're all speaking the same language and talking together. To take that, the league for years, um, prior to, let's say, four or five years ago, had uh, fits and starts going internationally. And, and I think it's fair to say that they confused activity with progress. If you go back over the history uh, of what we did, we played 62 games in various parts of the world. We played in Osaka, we played in Stockholm, we played in Australia. And, and we really didn't have a reason for doing that. And, and it wasn't until the, the last few years, we actually went and played in Mexico, and we had the largest crowd to ever watch an NFL game, 112,000 people in Azteca Stadium. And then we said, well, that was great. Let's go to China. And, and we actually hadn't even thought about how you go to China. Yet we had announced that we were playing there. And I think that was probably a good point for, for the league to take a step back. Uh, up until then, we had been funding something called the World League, which was really a European league. Yeah. And uh, that lasted for 13 years. And, and it was on the backs of our TV content going out to the UK, primarily in the 80s. We had turned people into fans. And, and we said, this is great. We will, we will capitalize upon this and have a league that's based around here. What we learned from that was that fans ultimately didn't want a product that wasn't the best product. They didn't want to see people who weren't the best. They loved the sport, and they wanted to see the best quality. So we retrenched, and we said, how are we actually going to build this thing properly internationally? And, and what that led to was the idea that we need to bring our best possible product, which was a regular season game, to markets. And we couldn't be everything to every market. We really needed to focus on specific markets. And so today, we've identified five markets that are currently the key markets, which is Canada, Mexico, UK, China, Japan. And then we've got a, a further strategy as to how we engage with fans around the world. The, the one thing that our research has shown is that we get fans one of two ways. We get fans either when they're young, which is below 21, so we focus on social media and education, or we get fans by people we call fan ambassadors, which is somebody who's already a fan who brings people in. Because we know it's a lot more fun to sit with your friends and watch the game than it is to just do it yourself. The referral business. But, yes. But, and, and the one market that I'll just uh, briefly talk about, and then pass it back to you, which is really proving out to be our model for growth, is the UK. Largely because Canada and Mexico, with their proximity to the US, are, are fairly mature NFL markets already. UK has been the one that we've really developed over the last seven years. And we've gone from when we started being the 18th most watched sport in the UK, which we were behind sports like kite surfing and different things. I have no idea how low we were. But we're now up to the, the, the sixth most watched sport in the UK. And uh, I know Roger's seen our games. Other people, I think, have seen it. But we've now moved from one regular season game at Wembley, which sells out 84,000 seats. We went to two this past year. Both sold those out, and we've just announced that we're going to play three next year in Wembley. A and one of the things that we really focus on is taking what makes the NFL different, which is we're not just a sport. We really strive to be the best sports entertainment product in the world. And with that, we don't just play games in the UK. We bring massive fan engagement events to get people to understand our sport. So one thing we did this year, we closed down Regent Street, which is a main thoroughfare in the UK, and had over 500,000 people come out and experience our sport. And it's a way that we go out, because just like most people know that we have the Super Bowl and we have Beyonce performing at halftime, we know that's part of the bombastic American performance that people who like our sport gravitate towards. No, it's a, and I, I'm going to touch on the whole engagement, the entertainment, the, the value in the stadium. 
uh, when we talk with the rest of the panel, I'll, I'll come back to that just now. But, you know, I, I look at Roger Goodall's plans with NFL, and you're, we're talking a 10 billion, just north of 10 billion revenue stream with the goal of being 25 billion by 2027. Now, the, the, watching t TV and this event came on, the Winston-Salem event on ESPN mm -hmm. down there, mm -hmm. and I thought, wow, this wow. is incredible. You know, I'm other time zone. I don't know if it was live, or it was probably live. And I thought, wow, that, that's, that's amazing. And I, you know, I think I called Boutros right away and said, look, let's, let's talk to these guys and, and let's maybe work together and see how we can come to, to, come to an agreement. So, but I still am wearing those bruises that, uh, <laughs> that these guys uh, gave to us. But no, they're, they're great partners. And, and from Lou's point of view and perspective, we do things differently at Emirates. Yeah. We, we feel we do. Uh, coming from his end, they probably had some issues with that. Of course, I wanted to paint the courts red and, and every court red and fly Emirates everywhere. But, you know, the, the point is you have to meet in the middle. And I think we did that with our negotiations. I wanted certain things. They gave us what they could. And, and we just negotiated. We went back and forth. And I think in the end, it was, it's a win-win. And now we've got the... Emirates Airline US Open Series that's shown in, in Winston or uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Cincinnati, but that's irrelevant to us. We're still building the brand and we need to build it all through America and this property is allowing us to do that. And it unites all of our tennis properties together in yeah. America, yeah. like our ATP rankings does sort of throughout the world. This is just another, another piece of the puzzle. Right, puzzle. And it ties into what you're doing back home here as well in Dubai. With the, with the tennis, sure. exactly, the yeah. Nature yeah. And, and David, I think uh, one of the important things, and, and worth mentioning, we'll talk about revenue as it relates to sponsorship. You opened up by talking about activation and how important right, it is to have sponsors who can activate around your event. The governing yeah. bodies can stage the competition. Uh, the municipality may be able to provide a facility, uh, some infrastructure. But sponsors, unless you have incredibly deep pockets, sponsors are required to create the excitement, the interest, the fan engagement, all of that. We looked at Emirates when, when we started the conversations and the reason we were so excited about this partnership, as, as, as we were looking to expand our, our, our brand and our, our platform globally, we looked at the network that, that Emirates has and, and said, how can we, one, expose ourselves to the world, activate more on a global basis, um, and, and who are the partners that can help us, help us do that? Mm. And, and there's no better partner for us uh, and on the series side, what's been really interesting is that event in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, right, takes great pride in the fact that they are part of the Emirates Airline U.S. Open Series, a global event. It has elevated the stature of the series in a way that we never anticipated um, and, and has really, has really worked. <laughs> no, no, you're sorry. And these guys, each, you know, each, each of these events across America, they're ambassadors for Emirates and Dubai. Yes. And that's huge. For the TV coverage is one thing. The 700,000 people plus at the U.S. Open itself is another thing. But you have all these events in pockets of America yeah. that they rave about Dubai. They rave about Emirates. They rave about the partnership. They're yeah. thrilled to have us. Two years ago, they didn't know where Dubai was or, or who Emirates was. Now yeah. we're helping to yeah. establish that reputation of what this great city of ours does and what the airline does. And, and that's the partnership, which is a, a true partnership yeah, between exactly. Dubai and Emirates, which has gone beyond, uh, I think, totally. from yep. sponsorship yep. to everywhere. Uh, I'm going to bring you in back. I, 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 go ahead, but I'm going to ask you another no, question. I just wanted to pick up on the point about the importance of the sponsors from the activation point of view. I think people often think about sponsors just about delivering cash. That, and and getting, a, getting a bit more sophisticated about it is really, is really important because without sponsors, you, you get much less local activation, you get less advertising, you get less... Uh, broadcast advertising spend. So they're absolutely fundamental to the, to the whole ecosystem. And thinking about the whole package of what a sponsor brings, not just the check for the rights fee, I think is really important. And I just wanted to... Well, I, I mean, we don't write a check and walk away. The, the activation, you know, we don't activate everywhere because it's, no. it's impossible. No. But we pick and choose. Yeah. I mean, otherwise, but, but, what's the point of doing but for, the But for, the emerge, for, a, for a host city in an emerging economy or emerging country, to have sponsors who are really active, I think, will make a qualitative difference to the event or how the event feels on the ground. Because if you're going to spend all this money on putting it on, it's got to still be fun to go to for the, for the spectators. Absolutely. And for people and I watching, watching, watching on telly. And the sponsors bring a lot of that razzmatazz. It was, I'll never forget when, uh, in London when the sponsors started activating before the games. That's when you know the circus has arrived in town. It's, it's there's a qualitative difference. Um, 
And that should, shouldn't be underestimated, the, the benefit that brings from the, the non-rights fee point of view. Yeah, I, I Mark, jump in, because the NFL going to England is about the circuses arriving. No, that's exactly right, and I couldn't agree more with them. One of the things that we've done, and you're absolutely right, it's not just about revenue, and it can't be, because that's very short-term thinking. What we do is we, we take our deals, and we not only look at the rights fee, but we actually build in a fund where we sit down with the partners and say, how can we find your business solutions, and how can we drive that through our property, and actually co-invest with that. So it's less about the dollars in for us and how do we then take this property and engage with partners? Because that means the partners will be with us. They'll be returning on their investment and they'll be with us for a long time. Because as anybody who's ever sold partnerships knows, it's a lot harder to, uh, to get somebody new than to keep an existing partner. Absolutely, and you want to keep that. Charlie, I'm going I'm gonna to go on the same theme and I'm just going to go step back a bit and say, uh, I'll use the experience from World Cup 2010. And the big FIFA juggernaut came into town, and it came with all the sponsors, and it was great. But here we were in the run-up trying to market this event. And you know, it's very difficult often when you're not in Europe to get people to go halfway across the world to come try and buy a ticket, and et cetera, et cetera. And you have to fill stadiums, and there's so mm -hmm. many big issues you're going to be uh, faced with in Baku. But one of the things we realized was it was great to have all these global sponsors coming to World Cup, but a lot of them, we were in a key market in South Africa. We were a very small market, and they'll show up on the day, and it was about the global market that they were carrying on and activating. And the question was begged, whose job is it to market this event? Is it the rights holder, FIFA? Is it the LOC that really has to take care of getting the stadiums, the infrastructure, the roads, the transport, the hotels, making sure the event runs smoothly? Is it the sponsors? But what if we don't have local sponsors? How are we going to create an event without local sponsors? It's like watching a football pitch with nobody in the audience. It just doesn't come across even on TV as well. So is there an advantage actually starting with a, a more of a clean slate in Baku? I think so. I think um, not, not having too aggressive revenue targets really helps because you do sometimes, you can lock out local sponsors if you set the bar too high and you can make it impossible for companies to invest. Um, I think it has to be the responsibility of the organizing committee. If they're res whoever's responsible for selling the tickets and filling the venues and putting on the show, I think has to be responsible for how it also feels. Um, and working very hard to find the, the sponsors who will activate. And if you're having problems doing that, to work with the ultimate rights holder um, who owns the series or who owns the, the next event to, to, to get them to agree to maybe um, adjust the pricing so that you can get the right local sponsors in to activate. Yeah. You, you know, these events are fun because of all the stuff that goes on around them and you want everyone to turn up and you want the media to turn up. Um, and so you can't price people out and you have to, especially when you're starting an event, I think when you're, when you're starting a new event, you have to invest. You can't just say this is going to make money the first time around. You have to think about it as a, as a long-term investment and sometimes the, the revenue line takes a hit for the first one or two. I think that's a good point when you're looking for new sponsors and you, you know you can imagine how often we get approached yeah. and how often we get approached for new events in, in emerging markets when I look at the proposal and I see the fees attached to some of these events I, I'm you know I'm floored I'm, really is this, this is really what you guys are trying <laughs> to sell us it has to be about value as well you know the sponsor needs to ensure that they're getting value for money. I can't look at that final figure and think there's no way in the world this is worth it. I've got to look at all the benefits and then say, well, you know what, there's a number in my head before I see the, the final last page of the proposal and if that number doesn't, doesn't jive, then, you know, no thank you. And there's always room for negotiation, but if you're starting too high, then, then you're pricing yourself out of the, of the ballpark for sure. We, we, we actually got carried away with ourselves and we forgot to open the floor here for any questions. So if there are, we can start passing the microphone around. So, Simon, while we're waiting for the first question, what are your sponsors looking for? Is it more about, as you said, they're part of the industry and they're looking to invest in themselves? Are they looking for any specific returns that you're promising them? I've got about 10 different sponsor agendas that I satisfy. Um, Local, local government wants the world to know that science and technology happens in Edinburgh, so I make sure I've got three, five international stories that go right around the world so I can put them on their table at the end of the day. Um, the universities are mandated by the government to communicate to the world about what they do. Uh, that's not common the world over, but it is now prevalent in the UK, so I provide the platform for the universities to do that. I give them the audience. Mm. Uh, local industry, as I said, wants to tell the world that, they, that there's some big but invisible industries in Scotland 
uh, that are doing amazing things. The, I, the, the sound technology in the iPad and the iPhone and the, the iPods, all designed and made in Edinburgh. No one knows that. We give them a platform so they know it. There are people who have a need to communicate certain issues. You know, things come up like genetically modified foodstuffs or, or doping in sport, these sorts of things. There are platforms where it is nice to have a debate that's not moderated by the media. Mm. Very nice. So you provide that platform. Yeah. Do, uh, do we have some questions from the audience? Have I, have I asked them all? That's quite good. Well, let, let me ask one more, and, and, and this is for everybody to, to pitch in. And, you know, we seem to be, in a, and I think of now new European games, and I look at the stats and I look at viewership, and in particular in sport, but music, arts, and culture as well. And one of the biggest problems we have in even the most popular sports, I look at South Africa, is bums and seats, filling stadiums, um, the buzz. We've got so many great TV deals. You don't have to leave your phone. You don't have to, you know, so many new mediums we can watch everything in. Are we at risk of overkilling this market? Are we at risk of just creating too many events? Because the viewership numbers are starting to say we are. What are your thoughts on that, guys? I'll start with you, Charlie. I, I think that's connected. I think a lot of the, the, those issues are connected to, connected to pricing as well. I think one of the interesting challenges for the English Premier League is is ticket pricing and occupancy because price, <coughs> price have gone up by over 1100% in the last mm. 10 years. Um, and so you're changing the demographic of who's attending in the stadium. And one of the reasons that football, English football is so popular is because you've got these massively pa passionate fans in the stadium. Yeah. But if you're pricing those types of people out so it's all middle-aged men like me or you know, sitting there quietly, then it's not going to be as much fun. So what? I think and encouraging young people, encouraging people who are going to you know, really have a great time. And, and, and that's, to do with, that's to do with pricing and distribution. Do American sports have to eventually follow the route and say, look, pricing has to be capped eventually? Yeah. A ticket at $300, $400, $500 it, to see Buffalo play in Toronto, does that work anymore? Do we have to start doing kit branding like we're doing in the rest of the world? I mean, from, from our perspective, even though, as, as I said, the NFL is very successful, we're, we're, that's probably one of our biggest concerns from a business standpoint is the at-home experience is so good. And it's not just that you can watch on a great TV and see that. It's all the other elements that you can get. You know, you have your mobile tablets, you have other data. So you can actually customize the experience the way you want to do that. And so one of the things that we're working very hard to is investing in technology so that people can enjoy the replays, they can enjoy different angles from their stadium seat and really working hard. Because I think we're learning that we can't take ticket holders for granted. You know, there is a very viable, option where you can watch a great game, you can go to your fridge, you don't have to pay an expensive money for a drink or food, and so we're very concerned about that. That's one of the things that we're focusing on, making that experience better. But, the, the, I mean, yeah. these guys are leaders, and I don't know how many people in the, in the audience are NFL fans, but I'm an avid one, and, and, you know, I'll watch a game, I'll have my tablet going, I'll be texting my friend all at the same time, and I think it's something that we all have to capitalize on, that, you know, the whole digital layer and how, we're, how we consume sports now, you know, in the future. And you guys do a great job of it. A couple thoughts. I think as it relates to content, what we're seeing across the entire sports landscape is much of it is complementary. It's, it, it's not replacing. Folks are watching on TV yeah. with their iPad, engaging, tracking their fantasy teams, doing that. There is some pricing. That I, I think across the sports landscape, it sounds like uh, Premier League, certainly in the U.S., there are some concerns about have we priced true fans out of the market. Mm -hmm. um, I think that will adjust itself over time. Uh, but I also think one of the obligations, or one of the ways around that, is to enhance the value on site. So, so yeah. we take um, very seriously the need to program our venue with much more than tennis. We, we would describe ourselves much more as a festival with tennis as the hub than a true, just pure sports competition. Our, our fan is on site for seven hours. They may watch three or four hours of tennis. They're doing other things. Yeah. They're, they're engaging in the Emirates booth, back to sponsor activation. There are lines to get into mm. the Emirates booth. They've created engagement. Some of our other partners have created Correct. great experiences. Uh, and we put real value on that because we don't have the dollars to, to allow us to build that out. It's important to us. Uh, they're shopping, they're dining, there's entertainment on site. We, we, we really work hard 
so that as we take prices up, people still feel like, you know what, I got a, a lot of value. I stayed an extra hour, I did something that was, that was great fun, and, and it wasn't just purely about sitting in my seat watching the Roger, the am I going to go to an Emirates uh, Arsenal game one day, and in the front row there's going to be these wonderful seats with TVs in the back of them. <laughs> <laughs> Individual TVs on the back of them. Uh, we've got a question in the back. Over here. I don't um, know how we're doing on time. So. He's over there. Ah. Hi, um, Matt Cutler, editor of Sport Business International magazine. My question is for Mark. Um, if you had to bet your house on it, do you think we'll see a London-based franchise in the next decade? <laughs> we this question <laughs> always comes I up. I can't go it. anywhere I'm without this question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, to, I, I think the question comes up about a London franchise. And, and one of the things you think about, um, as you pointed out, our, our commissioner has done a phenomenal job growing our sport. And he is absolutely relentless. And he has said, we've got to be a $27 billion company by 2025. And, and one of the things is you have to look outside of that. To look at our model, we've been tasked with the idea of building that London fan base so that a team one day could be sustainable. We are, as I may have explained, we are a very interesting business model. We are owned by our 32 team owners. And what they look at is we, have, we share a number who now own EPL teams. We have three currently. We have a, a lot of global business people. And they're saying there's more opportunity out there. So let's make sure we're starting to prepare today so that when the time comes that maybe 32 teams doesn't belong in America as you're growing a, a global sport or an international sport, let's, let's make sure that we can sustain that. So the move, as I just said, we're going from two games to three games. That means we've got to sell 250,000 tickets next year. And, and a full season in a typical NFL is about 500,000, still less than what Lou's getting at the, the USDA, but uh, at the US Open. But you know, I, I think it's not as far off as people think. I think when you think strategically, it's not that far from the US. It's a market that has clearly responded and likes the product. That said, it's going to be disruptive, and I don't think you know, it'll be immediate. But I would say, you know, at least the way we're focusing, that we do believe that we will have a team in London one day. Do we have, do we have another question? I just got, I think we, we, we're got to cut off. We have to cut off now? We've done it. OK. Well, let me just say uh, thank you to Host Cities again for inviting us all to uh, have a great chat. Thank you to my panelists, and uh, I certainly hope you enjoyed it. We'll be available for questions if you have any. Thank you very much. <laughs>